This is new video into us from Gaza City. You can see people packing up their vehicles, making their way south ahead of Israel's evacuation deadline. Israel is ordering 1.1 million people to leave northern Gaza. That evacuation call includes emptying out hospitals, holding thousands of sick and wounded, and places where civilians have been trying to shelter from Israeli airstrikes. We have new reaction just into us from the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees. UNRWA warns that the Israeli siege has Gaza on the brink of collapse, and the agency calls the Israeli evacuation deadline horrendous, saying it will, quote, lead to unprecedented levels of misery and further push people in Gaza into the abyss. This is a look for you at the area in northern Gaza under the evacuation call. Gaza City is considered one of the most densely populated places in the Middle East. More than 2 million people live in an area covering about 225 square kilometres. That's about a third the size of Toronto. More than 100 Canadians have asked the federal government for help getting out of Gaza. For more on this, we're joined now by Arwa Damon. She's a journalist and the president of the International Network for Aid, Relief and Assistance. Arwa, thank you so much for making some time for us this morning, for speaking with us. We do appreciate this. Absolutely. I'd like to start, if I can, with that deadline, because last night we heard from Israel telling residents in northern Gaza that they have 24 hours to relocate. What was your reaction? What is your reaction to that warning? My reaction was paralyzing fear up to a certain degree because of the factors that you were just mentioning there in the introduction. I mean, imagine that already densely populated area all of a sudden having to be halved in terms of the number of people uh, that it, it can actually hold. So 2.2 million people already living on top of each other, already under bombardment, already lacking in fuel, electricity, water, and basic services are now going to be crushed into basically half of that space. The other big concern, of course, which was highlighted by the United Nations, is the logistics of this, of moving 1.1 million people. Quite simply, it's not feasible. It's practically impossible. And again, it goes back to the lack of fuel too. Many people are not able to jump into their cars and leave because their cars have either been damaged or they don't have the fuel to be able to run them. And then on top of that, the hospitals. Hospitals were already overrun. All of Gaza, all encompassed, has a bed capacity of about 2,500. There are thousands more injured who do not actually have beds where hospitals can treat them. Now, all of these people somehow need to be moved. And we have heard humanitarian organizations calling the expectation that hospitals can evacuate to basically be a death sentence for the injured who are there. And also, of course, those who were already in hospital because uh, they need life-saving services, people who are, are on kidney dialysis machines, people who are in the ICU, either because of this war or because of uh, something that happened to them before. People with families don't know how to evacuate or where to go. Add to that the area that they're being told to evacuate to, the southern part of the Strip, and I was just uh, getting a message from a friend of mine who's inside Gaza, that area is being bombarded. There has not been any sort of pause in the bombing to allow for this mass shift uh, of people to move from one area to another. And so this friend of mine, who's a mother of four, is absolutely terrified. She's in her house. They have dozens of other families that are cramming into their entire building, and none of them know where to go or even how to begin to evacuate. And then she brought up something that I think is very important. So Israel very often will bring down an entire building because one of their targets is inside it. They will say, oh, there was one Hamas fighter or this one apartment in the whole building was housing um, Hamas fighters or Hamas sympathizers. What she said to me was, look, at least in my neighborhood, I know who all my neighbors are. In theory, I know that all my neighbors and all the buildings around me do not have potential targets inside them. So at least here, maybe I'll be safe. But if I move to the south and I move into unknown territory with the Israelis still bombing it, I don't know who's around me. And I don't know if by moving there, I'll actually end up being a target and accidentally seeing my children be murdered. Yeah. 
you, of course, Arwa, you have covered this conflict in the Middle East for so, so many years. And you have said uh, in the past that war requires people to dehumanize each other. Why is that so dangerous? Because we lose our humanity. And when we lose our humanity, we lose our ability to sympathize and have compassion for the victims. And when we lose that, we lose our ability to try to pressure governments and armed groups that are involved in conflict to begin to look towards a different solution. When we dehumanize because of the rhetoric of war, which dehumanizes to begin with, um, one example of that uh, is what's happening right now in Gaza, right? From If we look at this in terms of military speak, the severe bombardment of a target area in military speak is called softening the target. That doesn't sound like it's doing anything to a civilian population. It's very dehumanizing rhetoric, whereas softening the target actually, especially in this case, means killing and injuring thousands of civilians. And when we allow this, this dehumanizing rhetoric to sort of take over the narrative, then we lose our capacity to feel compassion. And when we do that, people end up hardening themselves into these positions that then only feeds into this cycle of very viscerally angry and vicious rhetoric and actions as well. We cannot allow ourselves to be sucked into this narrative of dehumanization. We have to recognize that we each have an individual responsibility to understand the past, to understand what has brought us to this point, not to justify what is happening, but so that we can understand what needs to be done so that it's not repeated. And we need to also understand all of this so that we can continue to view each other as fellow human beings. That is one of the biggest risks of war. And that is that we lose our humanity, which we sadly see happening over and over again. Arwa, just finally here, you and I were, were speaking just a moment before this conversation started, and you told me that your greatest fear right now is that power is entirely lost. Why? Why is that your biggest fear? Because when power goes, that is when cell phones start to die. That is when internet connection goes. That is when Gaza does not end up dark, just in terms of the fact that there are no lights on. That is when Gaza plunges into a communication void. That is when we don't know what's happening there. And my big fear is that this will happen and we won't know what has taken place in Gaza. We won't know the level of violence, of live loss, of what has actually transpired in there until it's too late, until it's already over. Arwa, thank you for your time today. It was great to speak with you. We really do appreciate this. Thank you.